Hi, my name is Ashley. I'm 35 and I was diagnosed with a rare degenerative neurological condition called Friedrich's ataxia just over seven years ago now. Now, I know, I've heard of this uh, disability because it's a, it's a, like, it's, is a type of muscular dystrophy? Um. Of to- sorts? Kind of. Okay. Yeah, what is it, Ash? I don't, know, I don't really know what it is either. It's neuromuscular, so it affects um, mainly your balance and coordination. That's what ataxia refers to. Um, oh. So you kind of end up looking like you're drunk. Right. Um, are you looking like you're drunk or are you actually drunk? No, I'm not. But you know what? The funny thing is when I was growing up before I was diagnosed, so probably early 20s, um, you start going out to pubs and nightclubs, um, I'd be lining up and I'd get to the front of the line and they would say to me, how many drinks have you had tonight? No way. This is before yeah. you knew you were, had it. Yep. Oh. oh, that is much more interesting because M. Carey has spoken about the same thing. She has, um, uh, she is paraplegic, so she has struggled walking and yeah. bounces be like, well, look at you stumbling up here. Yeah. And I'd say I haven't even had me yet, but, um, yeah, obviously knew my gait was a little bit strange. So, um, yeah, that was probably the first sign along with. Quite a few other things. That Diagnosed by a nightclub bouncer. That's it. What a yeah. story. I was going to say. <laughs> so we'll get into your story a bit more. So the work you do at Able Foods, we work together there. And we do. Also, you're a bit of an NDIS expert. You're on the NDIS. You help deal with um, people who are on the NDIS at Able Foods and stuff. So we're going to fire some questions at you. Mm. Well, I'm going to get some questions too, aren't I, Angus? Yeah, you do. I've got, we asked on our socials and had a lot of response. A lot of them very specific to individual stories, which we're kind of going to steer away for. Just We're going to talk a bit more generically. But we also, at this point, didn't want to chat to someone from the NDIS and get this, you know. The, poli- the, the political spiel. Yeah, you know, the, everything's great and, you know, flowers and puppies. So we're going to kind of get some real chat about the NDIS and hopefully you can answer some questions. Um, being somebody who uses and has been on the other side of um, chatting to people with their own um, stories as well. So looking forward to that. But um, I was just going to start by saying probably one of the most important things as well about you, which I love. Have you been to every Bon Jovi concert for the last 20 years? <laughs> Someone has told you that, haven't they? You have, haven't I, you? I have. Probably every single one that he's come out to Melbourne since I was seven. That's wow. nice. That's um, Is dedication. John, John Bon Jovi a bit before your demo? Yeah, a little bit before my time. Um, I got brainwashed by an auntie when I was a lot younger. Mm. I think I was singing the words to the Living on Prayer when I was two Right. What? Is he that's still a... your hall pass these days? No. <laughs> okay, it's changed. Update a little bit. He's yeah. like 70 now. So oh, that's good. Is it I your karaoke about, song of choice? He's about 60 now. Oh, so you so know. He's still good looking, but. Is um, it your karaoke song of choice? Um, oh, yeah. Give hmm? us a bit now. So. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> So, you, Ash, you obviously weren't born with your disability. Um, you found out, like, well, you, well, actually, you just forget. So, actually, talk, okay. In educate. your 20s? Yeah, I was diagnosed at 28, which is considered a late onset diagnosis, but it's actually a genetic condition. So you are born with it. You, your parents are carriers of a gene, Mm. um, and they pass on the faulty gene to their child. Now you use the word faulty. Is that, uh, I'm going to say it's a bad copy of a gene. So there's a one in four chance if you're a carrier to pass it on to your child. Mm. So I'm that. One in four. Did they know they were carriers before you? No. Um, there's about one in 90 people are carriers oh. of the gene, which is. That's high. Yeah. Mm. But unless you Match meet with another someone one. Mm. that's also a carrier and have a child, there's still only a one in four chance, which okay. is mm. kind of pretty high. So a lot of people that have siblings, um, they both have the condition. And you have siblings? I have a twin sister. And she's in a chair too? No. Oh. Where Dylan knew this. I mean, he's asking I questions. I mean, obviously he's asking questions. That I are... mean, we can just cancel the pot if you want. <laughs> That's a big point. my job over here. We are fraternal, so we're not identical. So. Do you know that if you were to be identical, you both would definitely have it? I, would or wouldn't, maybe? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. But fraternal, me, you know, obviously means that you're not identical, uh, obviously, but... Um, so she has no disability at all, completely able-bodied. No. And I mean, even parents as carriers, if you're a carrier of the gene, you don't have any symptoms. Yeah. And so she had a 25% chance though, like you did, of getting it as well. 
Yeah. Uh, just when it came to the lottery. So I always say she got the good genes. The genetic yeah. lottery, literally. Do you think it's good genes and you got the bad genes? How do you feel about that situation? Um, obviously, if I could wish the condition away, I would. Well, not obviously, um, because this is a... Yeah, see, that's interesting because I wouldn't. Yeah, I feel like mine's a little bit different because I spent the first 28 years mm. of my life without a disability, so I know what it's like to live like live life without one. Yep. Um, but we also have people who have accidents and have been on our podcast and similar, also say that they yeah. want, you know, they would keep their life the way it is. And I actually really appreciate your honesty in so this because I. I, we don't want the, my life's great now and I've adapted to disability and I wouldn't change anything because there are a lot of people, able-bodied people, myself, and I go, really? Do you, are you trying to tell yourself that? Are you convincing mm. yourself of this? Whereas you can kind of say that. Yeah, it's a. Hard one. I mean, I like myself. Mm -hmm. I like my life. There's not a lot of things I would change, but if you could get rid of the disability, I definitely would. Why is that? Um, it presents, it affects every single part of my life. Um, most mm -hmm. people think it's just a mobility issue. So your balance and coordination are affected, which eventually leads to a loss of mobility. People end up using a walking aid. So a walker, a walking stick or a cane, and eventually a wheelchair. Um, and you're in a little scooter that Chris yeah, on a scooter, scooter these scooter. days. It's a really cool. Scooter. It's actually one of the most gangster looking yeah, scooters. Cool. You <laughs> came in cool. Angus, were you like, that's sick. Yeah. Well, I haven't seen one. I've seen so many people in chairs. I've never seen the actual mobility and scooter. Obviously this is a, a audio medium, but to describe it, it's like a, what you would describe as an old school, like a granny style scooter, but actually like pimped out and mm. cool and sleek and compact. Yeah. It doesn't <laughs> have a sense? basket at the front for yeah. your shoulder. And a horn and stupid mirrors. It's not an old lady scooter. No, <laughs> it's actually cool. Ah. Sorry, I'll go on. So apart from the mobility, it affects um, lots of different things. So um, you can develop diabetes, um, slurred speech, difficulty swallowing, um, and they're all the neurological things. So, um, impaired vision, hearing loss, um, and probably the most serious one is a heart condition called cardiomyopathy. So every year I go and get a echocardiogram, which I'm actually going for next week. And that's pretty much a ultrasound of your heart. And they, um, check for any changes that have happened in the past year. What, what, were, you, what were you dreading more, that appointment or this podcast record? Oh, I don't know. Probably this one. I've, <laughs> I've done heaps of them. I've done heaps of the echoes before, so I'm pretty good I with like them. It. I know what cardiomyopathy is. Uh, tragically, I lost my beautiful first dog. His name is Axel. He's oh. a great Dane and he had cardiomyopathy. And towards the end, uh, we kind of gave him on medication a week of his life, but his heart to kind of control his heart, but his heart was beating like, Five times a second. Yeah. It was like, you, I put, really? yeah, it was like, I, yeah. I can't even, I couldn't clap as fast as his heart was beating. So it was basically like he was nonstop sprinting. And so, yeah, we had to, um, put him down. Yeah. It's so just, not everyone with condition gets the, the heart disease to go with it. So it's something that's monitored and yeah, it can lead to loss of life early. Um, if you develop a serious condition. So. Yeah. Something that medication can't really prolong. I mean, can't. it's literally your heart beating mm -hmm. at an incredibly rapid rate. Mm -hmm. So when you were growing up, so you were diagnosed when you were 28, did you have moments now when you reflect when you were 14 and you started falling over? And yeah. so can you think back and think about times when you started to realize your body might've been a bit different? Yeah, definitely. Um, we kind of pass it off as maybe I was uncoordinated growing up. I actually used to play tennis competitively um, growing up, probably up until I was about 18. Um, probably around 16, I noticed that when I threw the ball up to serve, um, if I looked too far up and wasn't looking at the ground anymore, um, I was kind of a little bit off balance. And that's because you don't realise how much you need your vision mm, for your balance. Mm. Um, so that's one of those things. It's like when you go to the gym or you try and stretch your body and it's always good to just p pick out a blade of grass or something and concentrate yeah. on that one moment to try and keep your balance. That's something I still do today yeah. in the gym when I stretch before. Don't they say that when you like, also when you, not that I can do it, but if you're trying to do something where you're spinning around, you got to try and keep one point or something. Well, think about a ballet dancer. Yeah. And so you see their head 
quickly flick back onto the one moment. So they'll hold it as long as they can with their eyes, ah. spin around and try and catch it again. Ash, that's what you and balance. I are doing wrong. That's why we have bad balance. <laughs> Not enough neck spinning. But that is interesting though, because with the serve motion of tennis throwing it up, chucking your head up as well to keep it. I can yeah. understand how, but I can also probably think that you just think you, you probably just, that's a throwaway. Like, oh, okay, whatever. Yeah. It, it's, it probably wasn't bad enough that it really affected too much of my life. So I thought, oh, I can compensate by throwing the ball toss up shorter so I don't have to look up uh, for yeah. as long. Look to the horizon. So. Yeah. But so you you kind of threw that one away, literally, as as just like a one-off thing? Was it yeah. a com- Was it, what was the next combination to try? Um. I couldn't do stairs. Well, I could do them, but I needed a, a handrail all the time. And that was the first, that was when you were like, all right, something's yeah. going on here. Where were you when that happened? Um, I'm going to say high school. You know how double story you would need to go up and down stairs to get to yeah. different classes? There's no so, elevator high, high school. But yeah. you got diagnosed 28. I know. Ages ago, you see. So what do you mean? At high school, you knew, but you just didn't go see a doctor about no. it? No. I, I, I lie. I did. But it was later on, so when I was probably about 18 or 19, I went to get orthotics. So I went to see a podiatrist. He got me to walk up and down his corridor mm. quite a few times. So he was watching how I walked. Um, he sat me down and said, you've got a really strange gait, so you walk funny. Has there anyone ever told you that? And I was like, mm, I kind of knew that I was... A little bit uncoordinated. Um, he then went on to test my leg strength and he was like, mm, you haven't got many, like your muscles in your legs are there, but not very strong. So it was kind of like he would push down my leg and I had to push up and I couldn't really do it. Mm. So he pretty much flat out said to me, have you ever been checked for MS? Oh, really? So I went to get orthotics mm. and left thinking I might have MS. Multiple sclerosis. Sorry. That's but scary. The, the, that's what it would present it looked early like stages that. as. Yeah. 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 So what happened Just from there? Just those tests, yeah. Um, I did go to see a neurologist. So it was probably around 20. I went to go see one. They did a few neurological tests with me, strength stuff, listened to me talk. Um, and he pretty much decided from that that... Perhaps I had a small cerebe- cerebellum, which is the part of your brain that controls your... Like a form of cerebral palsy or something? No, oh, your cerebellum is your the part of your brain that controls your balance. Okay. So, yeah, he just said maybe that's smaller. Cerebellum, is that cerebral... Is that no, no, not cerebral palsy, cerebral. no, in the brain, yeah. yeah. So, you, so what, you left thinking, all right, that's all good. I'm was not, that great? Chilling. I don't have MS. That's 21. About 20. Okay. And then for the next eight years, you kind of went about your life. In the, denial. In I was going to say, Massive yeah. Denial. Yeah. Talk us through that. So um, you... so I was about 20 at that stage. I actually moved to London and kind of traveled, partied, tried to forget about my balance and just kind of do whatever. I was like, I've already been to a doctor. He doesn't think I've got MS. So we'll just live to that. Mm. Okay. It did get worse. He was like, come back if it gets worse. I didn't go back for ages. So, Eight yeah. Years. <laughs> it's a long Stop. time. Yeah. It is interesting though, the, the, the denial aspect of everything. I haven't, this, we haven't played in this space. Oh, it's, it, this is a terrible example, but a mate of mine knew that he had something wrong downstairs and he held off on it for four years just to find out because he knew that there was going to be problems, a problem down there. And, uh, he didn't, if you, he didn't transmit that to anybody else, oh. but he could, because he knew, but he was in denial for so long that he refused to go to a doctor just to get help. finally, mm. not even the help to get the final diagnosis mm. that it had happened to him Four years yeah. he went and he, he didn't tell any of us about it until he finally got it, wow. the, the diagnosis. Cause it was, he'd, he'd gone too far. Well, can you talk us through that feeling? Is it like. Because you're scared? Because you're guilty? What's the deal? Well, I think it's scared. Mm. The unknown, um, that something could be really wrong. Um, I never got, so I never got um, like a MRI or anything to confirm if I had MS or not. 
So the whole time I was in London, my balance gradually got worse. And I was like, yeah, I've definitely got MS. And they got some weird cobbled streets over there as they well. They do. So, and obviously you don't drive over there. You get the mm-hmm. tube everywhere and you walk. Oh so. my God, there's hectic accessibility problems yeah. there. Yeah. A lot of stairs. Stairs. Yeah, I hate it. Deep down there. Yeah. Um, so one day I actually ended up breaking my ankle because I fell over mm-hmm. while I was in London and couldn't get around with a cast on my leg. So I came home for three months. Um, I did end up going back to London, but, um, really hard to recover from a broken ankle when you've got no balance. Yeah. Who did you confide in over that period of time before the diagnosis? I live with um uh, my one of my housemates in London. Um, I went to high school with her, so she was probably my closest friend that I went through everything with. So what about your twin, your fraternal huh? twin? Yeah, like she knew everything. So, um, I actually hadn't told anyone that I went to go see a neurologist initially. When you're twenty, no, no one knew. So I didn't Not tell any parents. friends. Oh, my parents, okay. my sister, but didn't tell any friends. So. We all kind of knew something was going on, but I didn't tell anyone. Left unspoken, so kind of. I had no answers, so I thought if I just ignore it, did did your mate not ask me about it? Did yeah. you ever retrospectively now ask your friend that you live with in London? Did she know something was up as well? Oh, they all knew. Mm. Yeah, I think they just, just didn't, wasn't... didn't really go into too much detail with me because they knew it made me probably feel uncomfortable okay. or that's strange. Sad. I don't yeah. know. I can only put myself into your shoes to try and get questions about how I think I would feel in that moment to try and relate in some way, which is always difficult with this podcast, I find. But was, and I'm thinking about putting myself in your position and wondering, was that fear of being diagnosed and finally finding out what was going on physically? Did you feel like someone was going to just finally stop the roadblock of your life and go, oh, Europe, oh, you'll never go back to London. Yeah. You'll so never go to nightclubs. Maybe. Never... I feel like you think growing up, you don't learn a lot about disability. So I feel like you think it's a scary thing. Mm. Um, I was still quite young, still do, living out my dreams and that kind of thing. And you think, I don't want anyone to tell me something's going to change. and Someone's going to put limitations re- on you. Redirect your path. Yeah. Kind of thing. Tell you what your life is yeah. now. Here's, here's your circle and your bubble that we're going to put you mm. in. And you can't go outside it. Yeah, no, that would be tough. And that's why eight years you waited. I did. I'm sorry. But it actually took a long time to get diagnosed. So oh. it took a whole year. So you came so, back when you're 27 and then 28. Uh, I was about just turned 25. Okay. So you had a couple of years here. Was, yeah. was still trying to hang more, on to the more dream. More denial. Yeah. Mm. Hanging on to the dream. Yeah. <laughs> Way more de- denial. It kind of progressed to um, furniture walking. So I'd walk. Wow. You're touching. at that mode and yeah. you're still not going. Oh my to... God, stop. You're making me feel bad. But no, it's interesting. Yeah. Mm. I'd enough. like trail the walls at home. So I had like fingerprints of like me <laughs> touching walls. Um, I'd touch like the couch or I'd even got to the point where if I went out in public or go, I'd go shopping or to the footy or whatever, I'd hold on to someone's arm because I was yeah. scared about being knocked over. So no one, when you're hanging onto the walls at home said, Hey Ash, let's go to the doctor. Yeah, they did, but I wasn't ready. Okay. So. And they just let you go? Yep. Okay. Have, have you talked to your family and friends about that and what they felt at that moment? It I must think, be tough for your mum to yeah, beg you to go to a hospital or a I doctor. Think they were banning on me to be ready. Mm-hmm. But don't, isn't there a concern that it could be something yeah. that needs to yeah, be? Yeah, like what if it can be fixed? Yeah. Or, like well, the it, longer you prolong it, the, the more damage you're correct. doing. As a parent, like I'm just, that, I'd be wanting a, to like. Because Angus just had a child. He's yeah. just had his first. I think like daughter. what if my daughter, I'd be like, come on, please. We need to go see someone. But also, at the same time, you're a woman, like I independent. Like, and also like we already had gone to see a neurologist. Yeah. So. Almost a decade ago. Oh, it wasn't that long ago. It was like maybe six or <laughs> yeah, seven yeah, years yeah. before that. No, fair enough. Anyway, eventually worked up the courage to go back and see a neurologist. Um, a different one? Different one, I hope. Different one. Thank yeah. you. I was convinced it was MS. So I was like, Googled like mm. all my symptoms. <laughs> I was like, yep. Yeah, yeah, I do that. It's like anyone who gets a cold. Oh my God, what's going on with me? <laughs> yeah, never Google your <laughs> symptoms, everybody. Dr. Google is, yeah. Yeah. Don't, my partner should tell. I've died Loves four times. Loves Google. Yeah. Hey, I've got this. No, you don't. You just feel a bit different. 
Um, yeah, Dr. Google. Not good. Not good. So yeah, I went to see a neurologist. He specialized in MS. So it was like, this should be straightforward. This is the guy, yeah. Um, he, obviously my symptoms presented like MS. At this point, I could still walk unaided, but my gait was all over the place. I couldn't really walk that far without help. Um, he was like, yep, yeah, we'll do an MRI. I ended up doing three because they all came back clear. So, and he was like, oh, surely we've missed something here. So after the MRI. Well, do you know what they're looking for yeah. that you're clearing? Do, do mm, we? Yes. He missed it. So it's only like really small. I just had bad luck, haven't you, with doctors? <laughs> That's all seriousness. And that, it's not their fault. Like, they do the best oh, they can. Doing, of course. They're hard not trying gig, to miss gig. it. Yeah. That's a bummer. But he um, knew something was wrong if he's doing it three times. Well, he thought the machine wasn't strong enough. So it was like, we'll do a machine, uh, MRI in a different machine that's a bit stronger. Mm-hmm. So hopefully it'll pick, a, pick it up on that. Um, so that w- that whole year was pretty bad. Like I'd go and have a test, come back, sit in the waiting room and be like, great, he's going to diagnose me with something. And I'd walk in there and he'd say, no, nah, it was fine. So we still don't know. Mm-hmm. So I did a lumbar puncture, which is where they... Take your spinal fluid. Yes. So what, they do, what they do, Angus, is put it in the actual spinal cord and pull it out and test it. Yeah. I've seen the needle because yeah. uh, the epidural. Similar. Yeah. Mm, not fun. Did you have a kid recently? <laughs> huh. You wouldn't understand. <laughs> yeah. Not fun to have one of them. But obviously, like, even oh. when the person did it, they that, were like. Excuse me. That, oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a big one. Even when the person did it, they were like, it looks fine. So. I went back and they were like, yeah, it's fine. So. Well, hang on. You're, you're like hanging onto the walls to walk and they're like, yeah, you're fine. Yeah. I'm like, they're like, no, clearly something's wrong. Yeah. So they didn't give but up on you. Then they go, go home know, and, you know. He ended up calling me it. mystery girl in the end. I'd walk in he'd be like, mystery girl. Hmm. What can we do with you next? Oh, hang on. I hate that. Um, so he wanted to next take a bit of nerve from my ankle, like cut it out. And I was like, mm, I've already broken my ankle. I don't really want you to cut nerve out. Um, Do you know what that would have shown or what the purpose of getting I a particular nerve? don't know. No. I think you see something about the, I've kind of had it a bit with my legs, like you can have a nerve transplant where they try and move them around to promote movement and they can oh, okay. test how much it moves when it's triggered and stuff. Don't hold me to that medically, but... I had that with my feet when I was younger when I had a bit more feeling in that. And right. It mm. was like a nerve tendon transplant to try and help, but it did jack, jack S, S H I T. Um, <laughs> by the way, Dylan just winked at me because he knows that I have to edit out the consistent swearing <laughs> yeah. in each episode. Yeah, so I'm we just, already have enough parents who are wondering if we can change certain content. I can't deal with Dylan's bad language. So I'm a good boy. So wh- when was the D day? When did they find it out? Well, he didn't know what to do with me. After like a year, he was like, mm, no idea. So he went to a conference in Copenhagen, spoke to some doctors there about me, and was like, I'm going to send you to see a professor. And I took like all my test results over like the past how many years in to see this professor. I was with him for five minutes and he knew what was wrong with me. <gasps> Five minutes. I'm like, I've spent a year with this guy. Oh, I would have been so pissed. I know, but I, I always have this thing with like, it's kind of a leniency with doctors and vets. Hard gig for sure. Because it's such, how can you be an expert on everything? Like you've, you've got to have knowledge on everything, but you can't be an expert in everything. You know, but you can't be a master of all. I agree. And just to to juxtaposition on that, our point of view, which I agree with, man. Of course. Is that we spend so much bloody time there. It's devastating, isn't it? When you're there in hospital and you don't know what's going on, I can't even put into words how devastating it is. Mm. And this whole year, like my balance was getting worse. So I was like, what if we could be doing something in this year Mm. and we're just waiting for so long? Um, So you actually felt that even though you'd waited eight years? stop. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm not trying. I'm trying to get into the mindset of it. Yeah. Because did you, in those eight years... (laughs) Did you hope that it was going to maintain at a stage and not consistently Maybe. deteriorate? I was so, like, at one point I even thought, 
like even family had said to me, maybe you're just not fit enough. Yeah, go to the gym. Like mm. maybe you should go exercise. Yeah, that's Because I can understand that you thought, okay, this is as bad as it's going to get. And so when you got to 28 and you're now wall touching, you're like, okay, well, I, you know, it's time to yeah. get serious. So I understand the apprehensive and the rush of wanting to get it when it really starts, when you think maybe I'm not going to be able to walk. Cause that yeah. probably wasn't a realization when you were 23. Yeah. Okay. Wh- when you found out. <laughs> 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 I love it. It's good. I know I'm trying to not push it too hard cause I don't want to bring up no, anything. Let's that's push, too it. push, 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 me. push. She wants to be pushed. Um, <laughs> when you found out relief or grief? Yes. Relief. Relief oh. over grief. A diagnosis. Finally. Not grief. Oh, this I'm sucks. not just unfit. Okay. So like, yeah, spending so long trying to find out and even, I guess, having symptoms that long, you kind of get used to a certain way of life. So to have an answer is mm. amazing. Yeah. What were the first questions you asked the doctor um, when you find out? Oh, it's Fredericks, you're like, will I be able to walk? What's the first thing that goes? Great, great. So it was a genetic blood test in the end. So after all my tests, I only had to get a blood, 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 blood test. I know. Mm. Um, so the day I was diagnosed was pretty bad. Like the professor, he said to me, like, not, there's not many other things that I could deliver that would be worse news for you. It would be a brain tumor and that would be Is that how he worse. opened up? Yeah. And he said, holy um, moly. But don't you want that matter of but fact? But it's not though, I don't think. Did he, but did he do it in a more compassionate way mm, than that? Not really. Okay. Put a box of tissues on the desk okay. and said, yeah, brain tumor would be worse. This one um, has no treatment or cure. Um, you're going to be in a wheelchair in the space of 10 years. I'd recommend to get a house without stairs. And that uh, was it. Um, yeah, just on this line of chat uh, for my other company, not where we work, but it's called Get Skilled Access, a consulting company for uh, to educate people about disability. All our associates and consultants are disabled. And we've just put a proposal to the health department about this exact thing, because I did a talk to 3000 graduating doctors at Melbourne uni. How much education do you think they had about awareness and inclusion training of people with disability in those four years, Angus? I'm going to say none. Uh, he said less than 10 minutes. Yeah. So they deliver news like that. Yeah. And I'm not. I, bedside man is so important. And for, for disability, it's just a, like if you're broken your leg, you're broken your leg, but when you, it's a disability thing, oh. it's a bit different. You know what I mean? That's actually a very good point. Cause it's, it's harder to tell someone. You know, you've broken your toe to broken your femur, you know, and breaking the news that it's a worse break and, than you thought. But when it's a life changing. And when it's delivered like you have broken yeah. your femur. Yeah. Does that make, does that, that's how I relate yeah, it. Yeah, that's fine. And he's like, oh, guess what? At least you've got a brain tumor, but now you're in chair anyway. Catch you later. It's like, yeah. hang on. Yeah. Like, is that, it was it's pretty my bad. Life. So I left thinking I've had a great life up until now. Um, oh, wow. You immediately started to think like yeah. that. Yeah. Look, I was pretty devastated. Um, yeah, I just thought, gee, I've had a really good life up until now. It's going to be a lot different to what I thought, but hey, it can still be good. Do you still feel like that now? A bit, a bit devastated about it? No. Good. I like hearing that. <laughs> what, what about, and you Who's can be, in the room, by the way? Just me and mum. I was about, about to ask around this and you can be as honest here as you want. Um, how'd your family take it? Um, not great. Um, you mind telling us why? It's kind of happened? like a bit of grief. Like they had to mourn. Someone told them they had to mourn the loss of me. And I was like, I'm not dead. I'm still here. But they were like, you're going to have to mourn. But they believe that when you hear it. You um, know, it's hard in that moment. It's crazy. The parts of you that will no longer be around. And like, there's going to be a new side of Ashley. And you have to mourn the old Ashley. Mm, yeah. It's tough, Ash. And, and it's you wouldn't actually probably have seen the full grief of the, of your family because they would try and hide it, I guess, as much as they could away from you. Do you think? Perhaps. Yeah. I mean, it was pretty tough on them, but they were more worried about me in that instance. Was your twin worried that she was also going to get the same fate, I guess? Yeah. No. Was she supportive? I think, look, it's a condition that's normally diagnosed in children. So... Um, so you're the abnormality that you made it to 28 without realizing. Yeah, look, if hey, I pushed been hard, earlier. it could have been way <laughs> no, earlier. Could have been 18. <laughs> <laughs> you, were, you were walking around boutique nightclub just hanging on around the walls. I was. <laughs> I like that. I used to like She's just, wasted. I couldn't even go out in like heels. I used to have to go out in flats because yeah. oh, wow. can't get around. But the, it leads it, to my problems though. <laughs> 
But um, yeah, my twin Abby, she was um, yeah, pretty upset about it. But she is a nurse, so she was like huh? pretty supportive and helped me kind of navigate um, medical things. Did she go and have any tests? No. Okay. So she doesn't have any symptoms. Okay. Um, so it's if, like COVID. Symptoms <laughs> tests. I know, but um, <laughs> she. Thanks, Doctor Dill. Thank you guys, uh, anyway, catch you guys later. Another yeah, week. Yeah. <laughs> um, she would if she um, is planning on having children, or when that time comes, she would get tested oh, and her partner. to see if she's a carrier and her partner's carrier. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. That they're both matches and they have a decision yeah. to make around. So if they even want to. so, because my mum's a carrier, obviously some some of her siblings might be carriers. So mm. even my cousin has been tested. So when yep. he was having kids, he went and got tested to see if he was a carrier. Sometimes this can, uh, just in previous episodes that we've had with certain um, diagnoses of illnesses and disabilities, but it can affect genders more than others. Like it can be carried through the female and only affect females, but not males. I'm thinking of Steph Agnew, I believe. It was somebody, yeah. but it was like the girls were affected or the boys were affected yeah. in the family only. Yeah, Maybe, no, yeah. This one, both. Okay. So it's both. Doesn't discriminate. Yeah. Okay. And your, how, how is your, I guess, mom and mainly your mom, but parents as well feel now? Are they proud of what's, how you are? Do they yeah, still definitely. still treat you the same as pre, pre-diagnosis, do you think now? I think so. Good. Okay. Um, they, or my mum in, in particular, um, she is, yeah, pretty proud of what I've achieved. Um, she is probably most proud that I'm still a pretty positive person. So mm. I don't try and let my disability define me. I still do what I want to do. And, um, yeah, I'm pretty happy most of the time. So was it a, uh, just a one story house that you grew up in the family home? It was. Oh, really? luckily. Would have been just like, oh, we're right. Just coincidentally, we're selling the home and we're just buying this flat one level exactly house. Right. I have another thing that I should have picked up on. I could never carry a glass of water, a tea or coffee, because I would shake so much that. I just can't believe you didn't go get diagnosed. <laughs> no, but you, I can but understand. You, uh, yeah, you but think I, that your life is going to say stop. Because I'm disabled. Yeah. I'm like, give me whatever makes my life easier. Because yeah. I grew up in it and you're right. So in my brain, I'm like, just get it, whatever help you yeah, need to I be just, yeah. the best you. I think I would have been pre this podcast and meeting Dylan and learning about dis- disability. I honestly I, think I would have been exactly like you. Okay. This is a great That's insight because we haven't had this yeah. kind of chat, have we? This cloud of just like everything's going to be okay or it'll go, it'll pass. It might go away. Yeah. Someone even said I it think... might be a vitamin D deficiency. Oh, that's yeah. so I was funny. like, imagine it was that. Imagine if you just had to, uh, yeah, have a bit more juice, vitamin <laughs> C. Go sit out in the sun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm the guy who waits until um, the very last, till I'm about to die to go to the mm. hospital. Yeah, I'm, I'm not far off though. For well. example, I had a. <laughs> Actually, in retrospect, like if I've got a kidney pain, I'm like, I'll be right. I'll wake up, sleep it off. Well, I got a perfect example of I had an ingrown hair on my nipple and it got infected. You're trying to compare your nipple to two people with I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I was, I was close to dying. Yeah. Because I waited till it was so bad that I went in, I had golden staff infection. Ooh. I had to be opened up. That was almost under like anesthetic. Gang- would have almost been gangrene. Gangrene. It was horrifying. So I've got a hole, I had a hole in my chest that they had to, I had to go fully under because I left it. It started off as an ingrown hair that I tried to, that I tried to pop with a rusty paper. Do you s- nice. Safety nails. How many nipples do you have now? I, it looks like I have three. <laughs> I like that. But that's what I'm saying. I waited to the last minute. Mm. I was like, it's going to go. It's just an infection. And yeah. then the antibiotics, by the time I got that, way too late to use them. But I, that's me. And I think if I was under that, I reckon I would go because I'd be fear. Someone's going to tell me to stop living my life. Yeah. That's probably how I yeah. think I would do it. Ash, thanks so much for coming Thank in, you. sharing your story and also sharing some wisdom and imparting <laughs> it, not just me, but everyone listening. Thanks for having me, boys. And you're definitely my favorite coworker over Angus. <laughs>